model, um, the technical lead for the asynchronous replication engine, which is internally we call it Backbeat. So I will not get into the nitty gritty of the details, but just give an overview of like how the architecture works based for cross-agent replication. Um, when, so when we built it, one thing we wanted to keep in mind was like we want to stick to uh, Amazon spec. Reason is that like people are familiar with the process. It itself is a monumental task to like understand like how and what is replicated between two regions on AWS. And now you don't want to learn something new again to figure out like how this replication works and for RS3, for example. And we want to leverage existing APIs, existing SDK. So you don't you don't have to come up with new tools or new code to make this thing work again. So at the heart of uh, at the heart of it, like what we are doing is like we are dropping this new container called Bagbeat, and it's at, at, at its heart it has a queue manager, and we are using Kafka. Uh, I've tried different queue managers, and right now Kafka is, uh, I think, is uh, agreed by everyone. Like it's, it's it has a super high throughput and feature rich for a queue manager. So that's what we are using for Bagbeat, and it has this producers consumers model, which basically like writes to a queue and consumers can you know uh, like they can work in parallel and uh, sort of like give you this multi-threading sense of uh, replicating mul uh, different entries at the same time to a different uh, to a, to the destination bucket. So how it works is that like so this is, this is, it's it's truly asynchronous. So you would have two different deployments. Uh, they are not communicating with each other during deployment. They, they get deployed separately. Uh, both of them will have backbeat. Uh, right now, since we are only supporting uh, the, in the first release, we are going to supporting the DR solution. So you would set up replication. You would have a bucket uh, in San Francisco, and you would have a bucket in New York. And so you have to enable uh, versioning for both buckets. That's a prerequisite for S3 API. And once you have versioning enabled, you can say, I want to replicate from this bucket in SF to this bucket in New York. And that's it. After that, like so, during the replication uh, setup, you can say, "I want to replicate all objects in this bucket, or only a subset of objects which start with this prefix will end up in the target bucket." So, depending on your configuration, uh, uh, the replication rules will be applied accordingly. So, let's say, for example, you you put an object key one, and it will be written so on. It will return to our metadata journal. So the Part of it is that like we want to use the journal as a source of truth, and the idea of this journal is like it's item important. No, many, no matter how many times you will rewrite the journal, you will end up in the exact same state of the database. You will never lose any updates that you have made to the bucket in terms of like whatever objects you put. Let's say, for example, you changed the ACLs of an object, or you changed uh, band aligned data of the object. All that stuff will still be there, no matter how many times we we have to replicate this. So that's that's one of the reasons metadata journal is chosen as a source of truth. So as soon as you write an object to the bucket, it makes an entry in the S3 metadata and the metadata writes to this journal. And we will we have a uh, bagbit has this producer which wakes up every like let's say five seconds or ten seconds and it's gonna look at entries. When you have a replication enabled on the bucket, the entry will be written with the replication status pending. So uh, until like for example, if it's a if it's a big object, if you keep doing like head object on the uh, whatever object you just you just put, you can see that it will say replication status pending, and when the action is completed, you, you will have a status saying the action is completed, and on the destination, you, it will say that the action is oh this this object is a replica. So you can clearly differentiate which objects came from a different region. So as soon as an entry is made in the journal, we look for entries which say pending, and it doesn't matter. Uh, what which bucket is it? Uh, like we're ag ag the design is agnostic to that. So with the producer, all it sees is like, oh, it's a met it's a metadata entry for bucket object combination. Okay, go right uh, in this uh, topic. So back so Kafka has this concept of topics, which are like logical separations uh, in in the queue uh, where things go. And underneath the topics, they have partitions, and partitions basically uh, are the ones which have uh, ordering within them. So if you write across multiple partitions with the same topic, ordering is not guaranteed. But this is a journal, and as I said, like we, sh we want to replicate one entry at a time in the, in, in the same order. So 
an entry belonging to the same bucket and object, it will end up in the same partition, and that's about it. So it can, um, uh, uh, different objects of the same bucket can be in different partitions, and you can have multiple consumers. So this way, we can achieve multi-threading asynchronous replication. So it's, you, you achieve much higher throughput, whether you have one bucket that you are writing heavily, or whether you have like 10 buckets that you are equally writing and replicating at the same time. So as soon as you write to Kafka, uh, we have uh, a consumer, which is like now listening. It, it, it's a, it works in a public subscribe fashion, so it's listening to this topic. As soon as any, any entries comes in, it wakes up, takes this entry, and then writes to the destination. First we write the data, then we write the metadata, uh, updating the status of the object. So let's go to the next step. This is zooming in a little bit into like what Bagweed looks like internally. Uh, there is the Kafka at its heart. Um, they will be exposing a REST API so that you can take a peek at like, okay, what's the status of replication? <coughs> is everything working? Has things have paused or like, what is estimated time, like this, this amount of data to be replicated, statistics, et cetera. Um, Kafka writes to its own log, and we have a series of producers, and we're gonna have a series of consumers. Um, right now, we we're introducing Bagbeat for asynchronous replication, but um, it's, it's, the design has been done so that like, we can write multiple extensions. The project is open source, so you can write multiple extensions and extend the core engine to do achieve many use cases, like the first use case we are addressing is replication. The second thing we can do is we just write another uh, extension or, or, or um, extension and we just call it like, let's say you want like life cycle to AWS S3, you can do that. Um, and the other one is like, let's say for example, you, you're building your own, uh, collecting like your own metric somewhere, you have your own elastic search going on and you want to like accumulate all the metrics in there, you can write your own extension to read from the Bagweed uh, Kafka and then write it to your Elasticsearch. So who uses and maybe the migration to another? So who uses that API that's part of Backbeat? Is that just for internal use for the application to handle the replication, or is it for a user to actually go in and check on the replication that's being used by Backbeat? It's it's the REST API is, is meant for internal use. It's for monitoring okay. purposes. So you want to you want you want to know like the your RPRT objectives like okay. Or for example, you want you just want to take a peek like every uh, every half an hour and see if the replication is continuing or if it just stalled for some reason, and you have like hundred terabytes to replicate. So. so is that the server connect? Is that the S3 connector that's using that API, or is it, that, could that just be like an operations person who's like, yeah. I wonder how my S3 replication is working scripts, right now? Tools, orchestration frameworks. It's, it's, it's not yeah. part of the S3 API. It is hosting its own REST API. Mm -hmm. And you can point, like you can build <laughs> like, uh, interfaces on top of it because it's just REST API. And um, uh, get, gather metrics, like how much data has been replicated, for example, in the last uh, one hour, or how long it's going to be to for replicate like the, the leftover data. Or are there any, what are the number of entries that have been replicated so far, ops per second, for example or uh, how many entries that are there to be replicated and how much time estimation there is. So these are the sty type of statistics we want to expose through this <laughs> API. And this is for internal use only. The end user, they can use S3 API. So S3 API has a, a method called head object. So you, you can take a peek at the object and see the metadata of the object. And one of the metadata properties is replication status. So as soon as you put an object, it will say pending, and you can keep querying it, it'll say pending, pending, and as soon as it's replicated, it'll say completed. For some reason, if there's an operational failure, for example, uh, since this is completely asynchronous, there are two different deployments between two different regions. Uh, if so, for some reason, the bucket at the target was accidentally deleted, or the versioning was disabled on the target, uh, we cannot replicate this object then. So we will just write, a, you know, replication status failed, and that for, that's the information for the user. Uh, operationally, they would probably look at the logs and say like, okay, we could not replicate because for someone, someone deleted the bucket on the target. Okay. And just to emphasize, Rahul said internal use, that is true, we will use it in our own tools, but it went by quickly. This is an open source project, so we do expect, expect people will use it, embed it, extend it. Okay. Oh, move on to the next one. Oh. 
is the demo part. Full screen. So I'm using Cyberduck for my demo. I have that was running. I know it's not that visible, but I'll try to expand it a little bit. So these are. Um, on the left-hand side, um, I have my deployment running in one region, and the right-hand side deployment is running in another region. So this is the source, the San Francisco. I just gave a name San Francisco. It's not actually San Francisco, but um, we have all the containers running. Uh, S3, Vault, and metadata is decoupled into a couple of containers. Um, there's the backbeat containers. There's a stateless ver version of the container. That is the uh, stateful version of the containers, which we call the backbeat queue. <coughs> and <clears throat> same thing on the target as well. Uh, we will have the same set of containers uh, running on the target. Technically, for the DR solution, we would not need a backbeat running on the on the destination. Uh, but we, as we are releasing features in Agile manner, like the next version, we will come up with a life cycle. And for life cycle, you can use um, the backbit on the target. And also, like, if you want to set bidirectional replication, and you can do that from this, uh, this, from, from this uh, region to that region. So. And let's go to Cyberduck, log in. So I have my San Francisco bucket. Let me open another browser. And the Paris bucket. So I set up these buckets for replication already. But if you go <laughs> by the AWS spec of setting up replication between two buckets, it's very involved. Like first, you have to create a bucket on the source. You have to create a bucket on destination, enable versioning, enable versioning. Then you have to create roles, and uh, you have to give like a trust policy for those roles in IAM, so that like when Backbeat can you gain temporary credentials to perform actions on behalf of the user, um, and then there is to be there needs to be a resource policy assigned, as in like Backbeat can do these set of S3 actions. Like underneath, when Backbeat is moving uh, metadata and data, it's it's using the S3 APIs. Um, it's authenticating itself using the Auth v4 signature, and it's communicating over two-way SSL. So, it's very uh, it's very secure. And one of the reasons we built it that way is like it it, it it's a very transfer like it gives view the user transparency of like how this replication is working. Like we don't have any um, uh, un unauthenticated routes, you know, in the in the background. The, that that was the idea. Was like we don't want any. Um, uh, uh, any loopholes in, in the API, like we just, you know, we, we firewall them or whatever, like we stick to the API and we are using the regular S3 uh, APIs to do the replication. So this, yeah. they're just as secure as any other uh, uh, methods you would use on the uh, AWS REST API. S3 REST Following API. Amazon semantics yep. very thoroughly. Yep. So I, I set up like the 20 step process. I already did, did that. You don't have to waste time on that. And now I'm going to put a, Object. I have like two images, so I'm gonna drop it in San Francisco bucket. That's fine. And there, we'll take a peek. It's very quick. So yeah, right. I caught it in right time. It's it's like a, in within like three to five seconds. So I have to open the window in right time. <laughs> Um, so it's it, as you can see, you just put it. You get you get the metadata saying replication status pending. Uh, the crazy long string you see is actually a version ID that gets associated with this object. And let's refresh the target bucket. And there it is. You do info, you see that the replication status is replica. And you will see the exact same version ID. Um, we have you're a fan of long strings. You can try to match <laughs> the version IDs for both of them. 
Uh, if you go back to the source bucket and do info, you can see that the replication status is completed. So for some reason, we are not able to replicate from source bucket to target bucket. Um, we're going to, there, there are going to be retries for some error situations, but uh, if, if it's absolute, like the bucket doesn't exist on the target or versioning is disabled for some reason, we will put replication status field and the user can retry uh, copying by copying an object or uh, some other action. So the object that's in, it's, you're replicating to Paris, is that right? Yeah, correct. Th that's totally readable, I can open that file and... Yeah. You so, would, yeah. Can I modify it? If I modify it, does it replicate back? Unless, if n not unless you have set up replication configuration on the back. Paris bucket to replicate back to... So SF. you can do dual, both way replication as long as you set it up that Yeah, way. You go it, one way or you have to cross over. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Technically, it's like you're setting one way this way and one way this way. Yep. And it looks bi-directional uh, from like a bird's eye view, but internally it's, it's one way and one way. Uh, <coughs> AWS spec, like they have a list of things that they replicate and a list of things that they don't, they don't replicate. And one of the things is like, we always replicate uh, any object updates, basically puts. And we also replicate, replicate any markers of delete. We, they call them delete mark conversion bucket. Uh, if you put objects and if, if you send a delete, it just marks the object deleted. The data is not actually deleted. Mm -hmm. So we replicate this marker over. So it looks like, okay, that data has been marked or deleted. If you actually try to delete an uh, object with that specific version, it's not replicated. Like data is not actually deleted on the target site. This is by the real spec as well. And if how do you manage these version, these like, um, what do you call them, versions which which are accumulating or the target or in the source? You can set up a life cycle policy, and say, I don't want version more than five versions sitting off. It's sitting for any object, for example, or I only want one one version uh, for an object. You can do that, and it's going to delete any uh, non current versions uh, automatically. And we can say if we replicate once we ram replicate to Amazon, that bucket can be lifecycle enabled, and that can send objects to Glacier. Sure. Yes. How do you handle? Say now you've got this this file in both places. How do I handle two different people editing that file and saving it? Is there any file locking? Version. Yeah. It's like version. That? It's it's version. So <laughs> uh, one of the uh, things about our versioning is that like you, there are two different deployments. Each deployment has sort of like its own unique identifier. Let's say call it a deployment ID or whatever. And the versioning uh, ID algorithm uses that. So when you come up with a version ID, it's very unique. And when you write with the version, nothing gets overwritten ever, unless like you have, you're have you matching the version somehow with the destination. Now you have your own unique strings for each deployment, so there's no way when you replicate a version that they conflict with the version on the destination and you accidentally overwrite someone else. So. <laughs> Two people can be writing in the same bucket with a replication setup in both ways, and nothing will be overwritten by any chance. Like at the very best, you may see like a non-current, um, like let's say his, his his update over, like became the master over here, or his update became the master over here, for example, depending on when the action occurred. 